Well, good evening, everyone. I tell you that uh, I found that probably years ago, and uh, it moved me uh, to think about things differently, uh, think outside the box. Uh, we do get pigeonholed, and we do get in a rut, and we do kind of get locked into doing things a certain way, and think that it can't be done no other way. Uh, but that's just not the case. Um, but the gospel is the main thing. That's what we're all about. That's what we should, our whole life should be about, the gospel and making it known to all people. Um, does anybody in, in, in this room believe in coincidences? You know, just, you know, uh, you know that, that word coincidence is funny. It's just basically a coincidence is just you just so happen to be in the right place at the right time. Right. You, you ever had some of that, those experiences like where it just so happens that you show up at the right place at the right time and, you know, uh, things just seem, seem to work out? That Those things happen from t- time to time. Uh, I'm not much on coincidence. I don't believe in coincidence. I'll just tell you that. Uh, I believe, I heard it said this way before, that uh, coincidences seem to happen to people that pray a lot. And there's a connection with that, that, that when people pray a lot, coincidences seem to happen a lot more often. So if you want to have a coincidence occur in your life and spend more time in prayer. That's how that works. We're going to look tonight. We've made our way a little further in the book of Acts. We're going to pick up a pretty, uh, I guess, a a common or or a well-known account in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 8, with the story of of Philip and the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, It's a rather interesting story. There's some neat things in there, uh, but there's some principles that we're going to see as well. The, The main idea is that we're going to see how the gospel works. It's going to be a little breakdown. We're going to see the, the, how the, the preparation of the gospel, and, and we're going to see uh, different facets of it and all those things. So we're just going to work our way through it, kind of like we did this morning, uh, and, uh, and I hope that you'll, uh, you'll glean some things from the passage uh, today. So let's, let's take a look. Let's get started in verse uh, 5 and, and 26. We're going to see there the preparation of the gospel. And the first thing that we'll see that the Spirit is sending that God is the author of, the, of these appointments, these coincidences, these chance meetings that we think. It says in verse 25, So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, uh, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And, and that's referring to, to, to Peter and John. We remembered how it finished up. They came to, to lend testimony and, and, and help in the, in the harvest there. And they had returned back to Jerusalem. And in verse 26 it says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And I like the little add-on there at the end. This is desert. Right? Yay! Philip saying, Yay! Awesome! You know, so whenever the, the, the Spirit of, of, the, of the Lord, uh, Angel of the Lord, all these things interplay, it's God that's behind this. This, this, this voice, this visitation, uh, this messenger was God. And, uh, you know, the gospel is flourishing in Samaria, right? We saw that. We, we saw people were getting saved. Uh, people were being baptized. The, the gospel is flourishing. And so in our day and age, I mean, if you, know, you, you get sent to a ministry field and people are getting saved left and right, the last thing you're looking to do is leave, right? That, that where you're seeing success in the gospel and that, 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 that the gospel is flourishing, the last thing you're thinking about is, Man, it's time for me to go. I really need to leave this place. And that's what the message was, that you need to go. You need to, to, to go where I tell you to go. So uh, something to keep in mind with God, how he works. Uh, where God leads it doesn't always make sense. Amen? Right? Where he leads, it doesn't always make sense. It doesn't always work out that way, that, that you may not wind up being where you thought you ever would. And I shared that with you guys. I never would have thought that I would have wound up in a little country church in Pitkin, Louisiana. But here I am. And this is where God would have me to be. And I'm thankful for that. So if you get this urge, you feel the, a leading for you to do something that don't quite seem normal or it seems weird, get counsel, right? You get, get some brothers and sisters together with you and y'all pray about it. Make sure it lines up with Scripture. But if God's in it, you better do it. Right, no matter how weird it is. If he tells you to go out there to, 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 to do something, then go. The gospel is flourishing, so he moved on. He went in the middle of nowhere, from what we can tell. This is the desert. This is an isolated place. Right? Didn't make sense at all. But what we see next, though, is that the believer is going. So the first one, the Spirit is sending, 
And the next thing we see is that the believer is going, and it's simple, just one little small part of the verse, 27a, so he arose and went. We don't see any discussion. We don't see any going back and forth. We don't see any of those things. Uh, we, we see Philip just being obedient. And so how could Philip just up and leave? How could you just do that? You know, have you ever took a step of faith? Have you ever moved when God told you to move and it just seemed uh, totally wrong, totally backwards, totally opposed to everything that you could think would be logical? You know, the only way you can do those things is because you have to know God's voice. That's how that happens. You're not going to do it. You won't make those moves. You won't take a step of faith if you don't know God's in it. You don't know God's voice. And that's how Philip knew. He had seen him work over and over again. Philip trusted God. He had seen it time and again. He's been coming, uh, seeing the work in Samaria and, and just the way that he's been moving in his life. Um, but one of the key things for, for Philip, for him to be able to go, and a main thing for you and I, I've said it before, Philip was available to go. He wasn't tied up. He didn't say, I'm busy, or I got this to do, or I got this meeting, or uh, I got uh, my kids got soccer practice, or, or I got to do this, or I got to do that. He didn't make excuses. Going back to this morning, he was available. So that's a key thing. So the Spirit is sending, believer is going, and the next thing we see is that the unbeliever is searching. Right? I, I find that most people that I, that I interact with they're looking for something. They're looking for answers. They don't know what they're looking for. Uh, they are seeking answers to, to why the world's the way it is, and they're seeking uh, to find some type of peace. So let's look and see what we see here in verse 27b uh, and uh, 28. It says, And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of uh, all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot. Uh, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. All right, so here you have an Ethiopian eunuch showing up at the temple to worship. How y'all think that went over? All right? They did have a, t- a court of the Gentiles. If you're familiar with how the, the temple was laid out, there is a place for them to worship, but he wouldn't be allowed in right, to the, the main area. The, the, he had a, a place he could go. So somehow or another, this Ethiopian had been exposed to some type of Judaism or the God of the Jews. And, and what he would have been known for in those days, the, would have been a God-fearer. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. That's what they were known. I think Cornelius, I think, was also a God-fearer. These were people that knew of God and, and respected God and reverent towards God, but you know, they're still, the faith is not there. They're just being religious. They're still seekers, if, if you will, might be a better way of, of, of describing them. And so uh, uh, he was aware. He had been, become aware. Uh, now when he showed up at the temple, uh, he would have those things against him. Two things. First of all, he was a Gentile. That's, that's, that's pretty big. They're not big on allowing Gentiles in or, or being around them. The Jews are. And the second thing, second thing is that he was a eunuch. Y'all know what a eunuch is? Do I have to explain that? Do I got to draw a picture? All right, good, good. All right, that's defilement. Right to, to the Jews that, that, that you're not going to be in. So he had that against him. He, had to, he was a, a Gentile and he's also a eunuch. But he was searching. And he was a man of great power and, and wealth. And he had a copy of the scroll, or, or a scroll probably of Isaiah. So you, that just kind of shows that the, the, the wealth he would have because, you know, they didn't have a Lifeway uh, bookstore back then. You know, to have a copy of a, a scroll of any kind would be special and would be costly. And he had one and he was reading it. Here's the thing that's funny about it. Uh, he thought that he was seeking after God, but it was actually the other way around. That God was seeking him. It's a, it's a kind of a, 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 I guess it depends on your perspective on things. You're thinking that you're seeking for God, but actually it's God seeking you. God's the one drawing you. So that's what we see going on here. So the spirit is sending, the believer is going, and then the unbeliever is searching. That's the, the preparation for the gospel. And then we move on. To verses 29 to 35, we're going to see the presentation of the gospel. The presentation of the gospel. Uh, the first thing that we see from the, our passage is that it's interactive. It's interactive. Verse 29, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip uh, ran to him and heard him reading the uh, prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. That has to, does your mind go places when you think about that? 
You know, you got you have this probably a caravan, right? It's not just one chariot. It's probably a, a large contingency because he was, uh, you know, uh, in authority or, or in part of the royal court, I guess, if you will. So you have several chariots and horses and wagons and probably foot soldiers and on and on, a, a quite a large entourage. And all of a sudden, here comes, here comes old Philip. How's it going? What you reading? Right? That, that's what comes to my mind. You got this guy come jogging up along and, uh, and says, what you got there? He overhears him. But see, when I say it's interactive, we're looking at this part where it's interactive, that, that we have a part to play. Uh, it's not, not a silent witness. Right? We need to express ourselves. We need to be used by God in that way. And, and you should be overjoyed that God invites us to be used by him. Right? He invites us to play, if you will. But here's the key. It's by his rules. And it's his timing, right? We have to go where he says to go when he says to go. What would have happened if Philip said, All right, Lord, I'll go. I'll go next week. Right? He'd have been standing out there in the middle of nowhere in the desert by himself for quite a while. He might have some, a, a good prayer time, I guess, but there would be no caravan. There would be no Ethiopian eunuch. That, that, that time of appointment had passed. Right? The, the time to move is when God tells you to move. Not later. You know, there's a window that God has these things orchestrated, divine appointments for you and for me. That's how this works. If he'd have waited, he would have missed it. We need to have our eyes and ears open for that moment of opportunity. When you see a, a, a moment of vulnerability, a, a crisis, you see a, a co-worker struggling, right? Tears, frustration in the workplace. There you go. There's a moment. Engage, interact. Is there, is there something wrong? It appears that something's going on here. Can I be of help? Can I pray with you? Right? Interact, move. God creates these moments. We have to open our mouths. That's what he says there. That's what, what Philip did. He, just, he didn't just run up along the chariot and see that he was reading and just sit there and stare at him, did he? He said, do you understand what you are reading? We have to interact. We have to engage. Use our mouths. Use our words. And we have to be confident in this one last thing here. God is behind all gospel encounters. There are no coincidences. Right? Y'all know that. Y'all know that. You have to know that. That you've, you've sat there in, 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 in waiting rooms in the hospitals. I, I, just a quick story. Uh, um, several years back, I guess early in my faith, let's see, I'll say 10 years ago, uh, my dad uh, got diagnosed. They found he had a tumor on his kidneys. And, and it's, you know, 90% of the time that, that it's, you know, they say it's cancerous. 90% of these type of tumors will be cancerous. And so we went with him and went over to Houston to have it operated on. And uh, as we sat in that waiting room, there was a woman sitting there. And she just started up a conversation, just, just as nice as can be, and, and engaged us. And, uh, you know, just sat there and, and comforted us. And, and uh, she gave me a, a, little, a little book, uh, Promises of the, Bi- of the Bible, uh, New King James translation, just a bunch of verses and stuff like that. And... Uh, she stayed there and, and just talked with us the whole time. And then whenever the, 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 the doctors came out and the procedure was done uh, and everything was fine, we turned around. That lady was gone. I don't know who she was. I, I think it was an angel for, personally. I'm not being all weird or anything like that. But uh, she said she was waiting on her husband, this and that. But whenever we got our word, she was right behind us. And then once everything was done and settled and we got the news that my dad was fine and it was not uh, cancerous, she was gone, right? No coincidences that God does these things. God puts people in your lives. Or, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to explain that, but I'm just saying that God does these things, and we need to be, have our eyes open and be ready. So the first thing in the pre- presentation of the gospel is that it's interactive. The next thing that we see is that it's scripture-based. We said that earlier. I think James said that. It's always important. If you're going to share the gospel, if you're going to be in, involved you broke it? What happened? I just, I just turn it off. If it's, if it's a mess, don't worry, don't worry about it. Don't want nobody had no seizure. Turn it off and on. It's scripture based, right? It's scripture based. That, that that always needs to be the center of what we're talking about. Not just 
uh, our own story, but God's story. So in verses 32 and 33, we see it says the place in the scripture uh, which he read was this. It said he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shears is silent. So he uh, opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Right? Perfect. What, what, what a text. So if you're going to walk up on somebody, this would be a good one to have. I mean, it, it's a slam dunk. Right? If you understand the scriptures, if you're familiar with your Bible, this is a slam dunk. You couldn't ask for a, a better uh, passage to, to be led into. Uh, but here's the key. The only way that Philip could in, engage or interact with this man or the scripture is if he was familiar with the Bible himself. All right? I must say it for the whatever time. Know your Bible. You need to know your Bible. If, if Philip wasn't familiar with the Bible, he couldn't do nothing with that passage. He'd be like, what are you reading? What is that? I don't even know what that is. And, and, and the, the eunuch would say, well, aren't you a Christian? Aren't you a, a, a man of God? You don't even know what, to, you never heard this before? All right? We need to know. We need to know our Bibles. Uh, Philip knew his Bible and could answer the eunuch's questions with facts, not with opinions or with guesses. Don't, don't do that. Right? Don't, don't do that. And whenever somebody has questions, you know, be, be confident in yourself enough to say, I don't know. That's okay. It's okay to, to say, I don't know, and then say, if you, if you would allow me to, to do some research and I'll get back with you, do that. I'd rather you do that than, than tell them just pull something out of the air or just something that you've heard before, right? Use the Bible. And also, uh, instead of the, using the Scripture, don't, don't focus on your testimony too much. There's a time and a place for personal testimony. I believe in that. I'm not, I'm not against testimony time. I'm not. Um, but we need to be proclaiming the gospel. It's God's story, not ours, that people need to hear. Right? People, the, the, the word of God is the power, the power for salvation, not our personal testimony. Now, we can use those, but we need to be reminded to focus on God's story, not ours. You hear what I'm saying? Don't say, oh, Brother Mike don't want us to share our testimony. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's a time and a place for that. But people primar- primarily need to hear the scriptures, need to hear the gospel. Always use the scriptures. Always. Uh, if you've done any of the share Jesus without fear or any other uh, uh, evangelism explosion or, or whatever uh, gospel sharing techniques, uh, carry a little New Testament with you, a little skinny, like a little evangelistic Bible or something like that. And you carry it with you. But now most people, you have a, a Bible on your phone or you can, you know, if you have a, a smartphone that, that, you know, a newer phone, you can download an app and you have your Bible with you all the time you can use to share with people. So, we, we have no excuse. Have it with you. And the, and the next thing we see on the presentation of the gospel is that it's Jesus-centered. I love this part. We miss this so much. Verse 34. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? There it is again. There's that slam dunk. He set him up. Then Philip opened his mouth, there we go again, about you know, engaging, being interactive, and beginning at this scripture, preach Jesus to him. Wow. Preach Jesus to him, from, starting from there and working his way through. Probably went to other places in the scriptures that he had, in Isaiah, and expounded on it. What a slam dunk. God had set him up for success. It's the right place, it was the right time. And it was the right questions. What a coincidence. Here's what he didn't do. Sometimes we do this, and I'm, and I'm guilty of it because I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to studying the Bible. Uh, I, I love facts. I love the history of the Bible. And sometimes I'll find myself getting engrossed in the backstory, story, and I, and I don't never get to the real story. Right? I, I, I load you down sometimes in my sermons, and I, I, I'm getting better at it. If I start to get that way, just pull me aside and say, you know, Brother Mike, we, we appreciate the background to the message, but, you know, you kind of overload that. Where's the message? You, you told us about the history of this and the tradition of that, but you never got to the, the meat of the text. And that's what he didn't do here. He didn't go in a long history lesson about Israel. 
He didn't give a bunch of background about Isaiah. He didn't give background on the history of shearing lambs. Right? He didn't do all of that. Philip preached Jesus from the scriptures he had before him. What a novel idea. Using the scriptures to preach Jesus. Wow, what a foreign concept in our day and age. Keep your message Jesus-centered. And the last thing we see uh, after we share the gospel, we see the proper response to the gospel, verses 36 to 40. And the first one, uh, the first part of the proper response is faith. Faith is the first proper response. Verse 36. Now as they went down the road, uh, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. Faith. Think about it. Are we going back to where were they at again? In the desert. What's the desert known for not having much of? God even provided the water to be baptized in. How about that? Yet another coincidence. Hmm? So we see that the eunuch was familiar with, you know, the religious practices, apparently. So he was familiar with Judaism because, you know, baptism isn't new to Christianity. You know that, right? Judaism was, was there's lots of baptisms and lots of uh, ritual washings and cleansings. So the, this eunuch understood that the, the, the importance of being baptized. He knew that. He knew probably about Christian baptism as well. And what this was... Uh, was a public display. I've already said that this was probably a large contingency, a large entourage of people. So it wasn't like he did it in secret. Right? So you have this pond, you have this puddle of water. We're not sure how big it was. I'm sure it probably wasn't too large of a body, just enough to, uh, to get down in. And, and the term in baptism, baptizo, the, the Greek, it means to immerse. Right? So that's where we get our immersion from. We're not big on sprinkling. Right or, or just dropping water on your forehead. We're we're looking at I mean just dunking people. That's what we do, right? Baptize them, and that's what he's talking about—an ex- exhibition of faith, an outward expression of his faith, of an inward decision that was made. He wanted to be baptized. Ain't that something? Y'all, y'all know anybody that that maybe has made a profession of faith but just doesn't want to be baptized? See no importance in being baptized? Anybody? They're out there. That's a strange creature that, that would make a profession of faith but say, no, nah, I don't, I don't want to be baptized. I don't think so. You know, salvation doesn't save you, right? We agree with that. We know it doesn't, but yet it's an act of obedience. It's that witness. It's that profession. It's that confession of faith before people because that's what it's meant to be. That's why the baptism's up here. That's why it's not out behind the building where we do it in secret after service. It's right here for everybody in the world to see what happens and what takes place. He wanted to be baptized. He wanted others to know that he had given his life to Jesus. And just think about it, the trickle-down effect. If if this guy, an authority in in the Ethiopian uh, government, would, would accept Christ, you think that would have an influence on the other Ethiopians in the city? Right? The trickle-down effect of the gospel is like a ripple effect that he might be the one that starts the whole thing. The next thing we see in the proper response is the confession. Verses 37b and 38. It says, And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Right? That word there, when we say we think about confession, confessing is much more than saying the right words. You hear me? It's much more than saying the right words because, you know, we do a good job. Our, our, our children can say the right words. Got good, good Sunday school teachers, good children's workers. Man, they pound them scriptures into them kids. Them kids can quote some scriptures to you, right? They can, they can sit there and parrot it back to you. That's what they call it, parroting. Like a parrot, like a pirate, you know, it sits on your shoulder, a little bird. You say it, they repeat it back and forth all day long. They can confess all this scripture to you all day long. But it's not a true confession. They're just, they're just blurting it out. They're repeating what they said. So that, that, this believing, this confession is different. Believing is agreeing and then submitting to those beliefs. It's not just, you know, just saying or, or repeating these things. Repeat after me. 
It's actually believing what you're, you're, you're saying, agreeing to what you're saying, and surrendering and submitting your life to those things. Agreeing that Jesus is the Son of God. Agreeing that Jesus is God. Right? Not just the Son of God, but Jesus is God. Agreeing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. Agreeing that Jesus alone is worthy of worship. Agreeing that Jesus is our only hope. That's what believing is. That's what the Ethiopian did. That's his confession. And the last thing we see is that he rejoiced. He rejoiced in verse 39. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and and he went on his way rejoicing. This is, this is one of the things that kind of has, has puzzled me my, my whole Christian life. Uh, when, you, when you think about people, when they get saved, or they've been saved, or they are saved, their Christian life, sometimes they just, their appearance and their countenance, their face looks like they're miserable. Right? Like you've been sucking on a bad lemon, right? All the time. They got this, you know, unemotional, they're, they're, they look like somebody just, you know, kicked their dog, lost their job, house burnt down. You know what I'm saying? It, just from their appearances, there's no joy, there's no happiness. You know what I'm saying? You, know, that, that you need to be reminded of what has happened. If you're in Christ, that you have been forgiven, right? Christ has paid your debt. You're no longer uh, uh, going to be punished for your sins. That, that, that hell is not in your future anymore. Right? That's something to celebrate. That's something to rejoice in. That should bring joy to your heart. If you wake up in the morning and you still have another breath, amen. But even if you didn't, you wake up in glory with Jesus. That's something to celebrate. This Ethiopian realized that he has just gone from death to life in an instant. Like that. Death to life. Instantly. From a hopeless sinner facing an eternity in hell to a righteous saint facing an eternity with Jesus. Right? Can you not celebrate that? Is that not, that's not something to make you rejoice over? Some people seem unhappy about it. Or at least they look that way. Right? So, he rejoiced. So I'll end with this. What about you tonight? What about you? Do you identify more with Philip? Uh, are you faithful to share the gospel? Are you available to go wherever and whenever? That's a big question. And do you know the scriptures? All these things are important. Or do you identify more with the eunuch? Or are you still searching for answers? There's good news. Just like Philip. Philip introduced the eunuch to Jesus. You can walk in these doors like the Ethiopian eunuch, but... By faith, you can walk out these doors saved like Philip tonight. So what will it be? Philip or like the eunuch? You want to leave this place saved or you want to leave this place uh, lost? Let's pray and then we'll have a moment of invitation. Father, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful for the example that we have of Philip and the way that uh, you orchestrated this whole thing, Father, that, that when somebody comes to faith, it is no coincidence. Uh, Father, that you put people in place. God, all you're looking for out of your people is to be faithful to do what you do, what you say to do, when you say to do it, and where you say to do it. So, Father, I pray that we would be obedient, God. I pray that, that we would be willing to, to go where you say to go and to do what you say to do, Father. And I pray that we would be aware of our situation, aware of our surroundings, Father, that we would look for opportunities, Father, that you've placed right before us, God. And so, Father, I pray again for courage in this place tonight as we have studied your word, Father, that salvation is available tonight, Father, that salvation is here tonight, that, uh, Father, for those that don't know you, God, I pray that tonight uh, they would go from death to life, Father. I pray that uh, you would give them the courage to, to, to do the things that need to be done, Father. And for your people, I just pray once again, that you would encourage their hearts, Father, that they would indeed be a people of joy. And Father, that, that, that their face would reflect the, 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 the true uh, feelings in their hearts, God, that, that you would remind them all over again tonight just to have a fresh vision of exactly what they have in store for them. Father, they have eternal life. 
Father, thank you again for this night and for this day and for this place and for these people. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.